Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Hoboken Baptist Church. Good to be here and good to see y'all here with us. May we stand together as we sing the first Noel. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. In fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No well, no well, no well, no well. Born is a king of Israel. For all to see. Thank you for so many gifts that you have brought to us. Lord, 
be sure. And Troy and Benji, y'all be sure and stay here with me for, don't forget, and, and then walk on out. But, but yeah, I was a uh, judge last year. I kind of OD'd on them cookies, so I'm going to let somebody else do that this year. But now if you need, like, for a prime rib dinner or a, or a ribeye dinner, let me know. I'll be glad to judge any of those affairs for you. But, uh, but I'll let somebody else do the cookies this year. <laughs> uh, may we stand together as we stand together and sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Come thy long expected Jesus for to set thy people free from my fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel's strength and consolation hope of all prayer list. I hope that you do. You will look at the uh, names that we have on our prayer list. Please remember in prayer and continue to pray for Mike Drew, Margaret Stevens, and Barbara Norris. And I was just told Barbara got a good report that uh, what they were looking at was not cancer. And we praise the Lord for that. 
and we give God the glory. Also remember Diane Johns in prayer. Pray for Derek Jones, Charles Gillis, Laura Thornton, Kelvin Steedley, also Steve Jones and Ashley McCoy, Donna Anderson, Brenda Rents, Jeffrey Dreggers, Bonnie Williams, Kenny Cravey, Bo Pallas, James Perry Jr., Baylor Steve, Amanda Anderson, Lauren Dowling, Neil Cushman, and if you would add the name of Linda Kuntz, a uh, friend of ours who had brain surgery, and praise the Lord is doing well. We remember our homebound, especially in this time of year. So we think of Evelyn Dowling and Hazel Lee, Mayo Gillis, Patsy Gamage, Corbell Dowling, Heather Dowling, Aletha Todd, Donald Hale, Hubert Strickland, Anna Sue Roberts, Mary Lane, and Roy Harris, as we pray for these before the Lord. Remembering those in our nursing home, Juanita Chesser, Janet Pitchford, Bennett Strickland, Eileen Strickland, also Mary Lee Wiley Shaw. And also tonight, if you have unspoken requests, would you just make it known by the uplifted hand, as I do, knowing that God understands and hears our prayers. Well, if you have someone you want to pray, just lift your hand and speak up loudly so we can hear who you want us to pray for and tell us who it is. Anyone that you want to remember in prayer? Yes. Okay, someone way back in the back. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Anyone else? Well, let us pray that we as God's people will keep Christ in Christmas. Most of all, we'll think about what it means, and what He means to us as individuals as we pray and seek the Lord together. I'm going to ask Brother Robert Hires to come up here and lead us in this time of prayer. As he prays aloud, would you pray silently? Would you pray for those around you? Pray for your church family. Pray for the needs of individuals. Pray for the unspoken requests that have been offered here before God tonight. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight just thanking you so very much. Thank you for uh, watching over us each and every day, Lord. I thank you for every time I see a sunset. I thank you how God has painted a picture that only you could paint. Lord, tonight we have so many that are on our sick list. Lord, we just ask that you would be with each one of them with each need that they have. Lord, those that are in nursing homes, Lord, this time of year is especially rough, Lord, we will help us to have compassion to them. Not to get on each and one of them to go visit them. Just a minute or two makes a great deal of difference. Lord, our country continues to spiral downward. And Lord, I just, I just pray. Pray for our leaders. I pray for our fellow citizens, Lord, that we can uh, all turn to the Lord Jesus Christ have all these problems <clears throat> taken care of by him. Lord, be with those in Israel, the greater people. Lord, I ask that you would just give them the power to defeat every one that's coming evilly against us. And Lord, I just pray that our, our country will stand sure-footed with the nation of Israel. And Lord, we just ask that you would uh, place that in the hearts of our leaders to not shy away, to make us stand and make us stand for what's right and what is the truth. Lord, tonight is just a beautiful night as we come together to uh, sing songs to you of our beautiful Savior's birth. Help us each one to remember 
always going to receive his crown. But Jesus Christ came to this earth, born of a virgin, and walked this earth for 33 years spreading his gospel. And Lord, we just ask that you would just uh, help us to do the same, help us to spread the gospel. Give us the, give us the strength and the uh, uh, bravery to do that. Lord, there are people this time of year that their hearts are tender. Lord, help us to be discerning and, and be ready in those positions and such that that presents itself. Lord, I thank you for my church family. I thank you for each and every one. And Lord, I ask blessing on this day. Blessing on Brother Ben and this day. And Lord, that uh, you just be with them at all times. Lord, open our hearts now and our minds to your word so that we may become strong and bold. Amen. Yes, thank you. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat a peace on earth, good will to men. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along through broken song of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will to men. Then peal the spells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the night prevail. With peace on earth, good will to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night till day. A voice, a chime, the chant sublime of peace on earth, good will to men. Have your Bibles tonight, turn to Leviticus in chapter 20, chapter 20 of the book of Leviticus. Tonight, as the writer Moses address penalties for things that you know better than to do. When you read the book of Leviticus, of course, there are a lot of laws, a lot of ensuring of the truth of God's word that he reminds us, I am the Lord, I am a holy God, I have no other gods before me. When you come to the 20th chapter of the book of Leviticus, you discover that here are 10 penalties that are mentioned and also one admonition, and we have them listed in nine, but two of them are together in one of the, uh, one of the phrases we use tonight. And uh, whereas the 18th chapter of Leviticus addresses uh, all these things from a God-given decree, the 20th chapter addresses the the violations and the responsibility of a community of believers to hold steadfast to the truth of God. 
You see, I firmly believe that one of the reasons America is where it is tonight is because the church has not held steadfast to the values that God has given us. When the church began to turn toward liberalism, the church began to turn away from the Bible, the church turned toward entertainment, and the church tor turned toward the real good, feel-good philosophy of some religion that had nothing anchored in the truth of the Word of God, then as the church began to drift, the nation began to drift. And we are where we are tonight as a people in America because of we, the church, who let down the standard. And God was saying to the children of Israel, now when you dwell in a certain land, you need to understand that you are to affect them by the way that you live. Jesus would reiterate that in the Gospels when he said you're to be salt and you're to be light. You're to be different. You're to stand out as those who follow the living God. And the precepts that he gives us here in the 20th chapter of the book of Leviticus are a good reminder that when you live in a land, you're to be a testimony to those who live about you and those who live among you and those with whom you live in the land in which we are. So let's stand out of respect to God's word. We'll read a few verses here in Leviticus chapter 20. The Bible says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Again you shall say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or a stranger that sojourn in Israel, that gives any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed, that is his children, unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man whom he giveth of his seed, his children, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards and go whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Father, bless your word. Help us to understand its truth and its meaning tonight as we share together out of your book, the way, the truth for our life, that we might live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. you may be seated. God is preparing the children of Israel to live in a heathen land. He's preparing them as they live among non-believers and they live among a nation of people who do not believe and practice such things that are anti-God and against God, that God's people are to be different and they're to stand out as those who honor God and not the things of this world. Good lesson for us in the United States of America. Amen. We are to be different. We're not to blend in with society like some chameleon. We are to be different, that the world may see that there is a Jesus because we desire to live just like that Jesus. And these penalties that he mentioned have to do with the sins that Israel was going to be confronted with and the sins within Israel, but especially around Israel in the communities where they were. And he was saying to them, now if you're the people of God, you must understand if you fall prey to these things, then there's going to be a penalty in your life just like a person who is not a child of God. Amen. And he said, I won't show any different. When you compromise and when you let down the standard and you go along with these things, then there's great jeopardy that will come against your life. He begins in, uh, in the article, as he does here, for the Lord spoke unto Moses, and he immediately says in verses uh, 2 through 5, that there's a penalty for the sins of idolatry. He mentions, as we have mentioned before, the worship of the god Molech. The worship of god Molech. Now the worship of god Molech, we told you before, was a great statue. It was heated to uh, an intense amount of heat. And these people, these heathen people, would take their children and lay them in the arms of that flaming, burning, edifice that they call Molech 
And the thing about that they would do, according to the historians who wrote of that period of time, that they would begin to beat on the drums. And the drum beats and the music would be so loud. And it had a purpose, not only for the attention of the people, but it was so that you could not hear the screams of the children as they were being put to death. Cannot imagine anything so horrible that somebody would take their child and place them in the arms of a God like that to destroy them. And yet we see that happening in America tonight. It's not a flaming God of fire, not a flaming God of some bronze-like statue, but it is the gods of this world that parents are giving their children to. You know, I watch in, in children's lives, and a lot of children never have an opportunity to be a child. They've been placed in the care of the gods of this world and orchestrated to live a life, something maybe their parents dream of, something that they dream of, but nonetheless it has nothing to do with really enjoying their childhood and learning what being a child is all about. It is placed in the arms of some other organization or some other person, and that child is literally sacrificed on the altar of worldliness to please the parents or to please society, and they've forgotten that the best teacher for a child is at home with their parents at the knees of their mother who reads to them the Word of God and prays with them and teaches them the stories of Jesus. But we don't want to talk about that in our society today. Oh, no, 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 no. But there, there are people today who have got their children, they're sacrificing them upon the altar of popularity and popular opinion, and then they wonder what's happened with their kids, and they wonder what's going wrong. God said when you sacrifice your children, the Lord said in verse 3, I will set my face against that man because he hath given his child unto a false god, unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. He says what this does is it takes away totally from the worship of God to something that worshiping something that is heathen. From worshiping God to worshiping something the world worships and being involved with those things instead of being involved with the things of God. So he has an edict that the penalty for the sins of idolatry, and this is as much idolatry as if you had some statue and you fall down before it and worship it as your God. Because I'm telling you, in our society today, there are many gods. And there are many gods that take on many forms that people would never deny, they would never walk away from, they would never miss being with. But God said they defile my sanctuary because they'll miss being with me. They'll miss praying to me. They'll miss reading my word. They'll miss talking to me. But they won't miss those things because they're sacrificing their children to the world. So it's an eye-opener. It's, it's an awakening thought for those that live in our society today. The second penalty he mentions is the penalty of the occult. And you know it's so easy to point at the occult and the cultic characters of our day and say how horrible that is. And we forget about that first penalty that he mentioned where you sacrifice your children to something besides the things of the living God. So now he talks about the occult when he says, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go after them, I will set my face against that soul. He said, Sanctify yourself therefore and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Now over in verse 27, he reiterates the same thing again. As I said, there are two of these put together. A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. God said when a person practices the occult here in the Old Testament, they were to be put to death. There is no grace there. It is simply the clear law of God. And it says that God's people are not to involve themselves in the occultic practices of this world in which we live. And today it is so insidiously desensitizing to our society that people think nothing about it. There are thousands of people who go to church that get up every morning and read the horoscope. You see, that's dealing with familiar wizards. That's dealing. There are people who are in church, and particularly young people who play with a Ouija board who have tarot cards, who have certain uh, fixtures that, that they look at to emulate and to decide what their future is going to be. 
And now they can do it on their cell phone. If they download a certain app, they can punch that app and it will give them some forecast or some prophecy or some futuristic thing that's going to happen in their life. All of those things have to do with the occult. And the occultic practices deny the presence and the authority of God. Now God said it's one thing for you to practice that, but it's something else for somebody who has that spirit. What does he mean? He means that they are demon-possessed. It means that they have that spirit dwelling within them that eschews that evil to the point that they constantly are practicing such things. You see, today we don't believe much about people being possessed, but I'm telling you, there are many people who are possessed in our society. And there are many who are walking around with the demonic forces in control of their life. And you look at them and their eyes are hollow and their thoughts are empty and their mind has no communication with the things around them that are pertinent to society, but they are involved in some foolishness of the world. You see, that is a person who needs the presence of Jesus Christ within their life to drive the demons out and to separate them from the familiar spirit. God said to play with wizards, to play with all these kind of occultic things is unreal. And yet we have many cults that are flourishing in America today. And they're flourishing in our society today. Then he says in verse 9, there are penalties of sins for immorality, and he begins to block all of them together as he lists them as sexual sins uh, all the way down through verse 13. The Bible says, For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely be put to death. He that hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. Now God lists that as immorality. It is immoral for a child to curse their parent. It is immoral for a child to look at their parent and say, I wish you were dead, or to curse them in some manner or some measure. It is against the will and the design of God. It is open immorality. It is immorality for a person to mistreat or to do disdain to the parents that God has given them. They may be poor parents. They may be sorry parents. They may be terrible parents. They may be awful parents. But God has said even in the measure of that, you are to treat them with respect and you are to pray for them and you are to lift them up before the Lord. God said for a man or a woman who brings disdain against their parents or curses them, they will be cut off from among their people. So God says to us in connection with this, verse 7 is in connection with verse 6, he says, sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I am the Lord your God. What in the earth does he have to mean with that in connection with verse 6? God said when you're in that situation that you have parents that are against the will of God or that are against you and the will of God and the things that you're doing with God, when you have a parent like that, God said, here's the answer for you. This is how you deal with it. Number one, you sanctify yourself. How do you sanctify yourself? You confess every known sin before God. You ask the Holy Spirit to clean your heart and to clean your life. You ask God to clean your mind of impure thoughts. Sanctification is the act of cleansing by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what happens. He continues in the cleansing process. The day you got saved, you received the Holy Ghost because no man saved without the Spirit of God. What well, it says in Romans 8 9. But when that process began, He came into your life to keep you clean and pure and holy before God. So God said in order to deal with these wayward parents, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to sanctify yourself and cleanse your heart so that you will be right with God. And then he says that you are to be holy. God says to be holy in deed, to be holy in thought, to be holy in action. Holiness is being like God. We talked about that last week, son. It's to understand that in holiness... We draw close to Him. And the Bible says, even in the book of Hebrews, without holiness no man shall see God. Lord, we've got to be clean by the power of the blood of the Lamb, but we've got to let the cleansing power of the Holy Ghost direct us in our life. And then He says, if you're going to 
If you're going to deal with those parents, you've got to understand this statement. For I am the Lord your God. I'm your God. I'm your God. Those are your parents, but I'm your God. Your parents do not become your God. And you don't become a God to your parents. There's only one God. And He is the one that you worship. And He is the one that you bow down before. And He is the one that you seek. But you do not mistreat, nor curse, nor become belligerent against your parents. You don't do that because you sanctify yourself. You learn that in the midst of the storm, you have a peace that makes you still. You learn that in all of the agitation, you have one upon whom you can lean. You learn that in all the upheaval and the uprising of those in your life, that you can lean upon Jesus because what was the statement that he gave to us? Cast your care upon me because I care for you. Don't take it out on your parents. Don't take it out on your children. Don't take it out on your friend. Don't take it out on anyone. Cast your care upon the Lord, for he careth for you. So you see, many times you can't deal with those people in their situations, whatever it may be, parents, children, friends, neighbors, whatever it is, even spouse. But what you can do is that you can go to the Lord and ask for the purifying, cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb to sustain you whereby you have peace with him because he is the Lord your God. And he says, you shall keep my statutes in verse 7, and you shall do them, and again, I am the Lord, which will cleanse your life, which will sanctify you according to my purposes in spirit and in truth. He deals with the sins of immorality. And then the penalty of the sins for adultery in verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, as he committeth adultery, he said with his neighbor, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death under the law. There was no retribution any other way except death itself. Many times to be stoned to death. We know that now by the grace of God that a person must die to self and they must live to Christ if they're going to survive. If they're going to survive. And if they're going to be what God would have them to be, even when they have someone who commits adultery, they must indeed let God handle it. And God must take control of it. Because you and I surely cannot. The only thing we can do is to pray for them that the Spirit of God would call them to repentance. So in verse 10 is a penalty for adultery. Verse 11 and 12 has to do with the penalty for incest. Whether he is talking about a man that lies with his father's wife, his mother or stepmother, or one that uncovered his father's nakedness because of them shall surely be put to death and their blood shall be upon them. If a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. The sin of incest is one of the most ungodly sins, and all sins are ungodly. It's one of the most hideous sins that occurs upon the face of this earth. And we have, we have today a pure epidemic of that going on in America today where fathers are molesting their daughters and mothers are molesting their sons. And on and on and on it goes with the hideous respect to sin itself. And God says that he forbids such and that it is abomination before him. So these sins of incest, Paul would mention that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where you remember the sin unto death where the young man was brought for gross sexual sin. And the Bible said such sin should not even be named among us. You know what Paul said was going to happen to this man? Now listen, the young man that did that was a Christian. The young man that did that was a saved young man. You mean a saved person can do that? A saved person can go into the slew of sin just like a lost person. The difference was that this young man, Paul said, here's what we're going to do with him. We're going to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his soul may be saved in the day of the Lord. 
You mean he'd still get to go to heaven? Yes, but he would die one of the most horrible deaths that anybody could ever imagine. You want to see a caricature of that? You just read through the book of Acts, where as Paul was preaching, and he pleaded with Herod, the great leader, to accept Christ. And Herod came with his robes of silver and gold that had been spun with the precious jewels. And when the people saw him step out on the balcony, they all fell down and said, Behold, it is a God, it is a God. And when he himself considered himself a God, that he was accountable to no man, he was accountable not to God, he was a God himself. You know what happened to him? God said that he sent the worms and they ate his flesh and literally ate him alive. Listen, God doesn't play with sin. God is a holy God. And God said there's one cure for sin, that's repentance and contrition because of sin. And he reminds that the sin of incest, the sin of adultery, the sin of sexuality outside of the framework of marriage, living together without the benefit of marriage is an abomination before God. And God said that we pay the price. Some people are living like that and they don't understand why they can't ever get ahead. They don't understand why they can't get successful. They don't understand why things can't go right for them. Well, I'm telling you, as long as you live in sin outside the will of God, how in God's name can you expect things to go right for you? It's an impossibility. The Bible says very plainly in the book of James that the working of iniquity does not work righteousness. That means that you cannot do wrong in order to do right, and when you do wrong, you can't be blessed for doing right because it's wrong in the sight and in the eyes of God. And yet today we dismiss it with a shrug of our shoulder. And we say, oh, well, you know, it's the way our society is today. Well, it may be, but one day there's coming an accounting before God Amen. when the record's going to be set straight. So there are the sins, the sexual sins, and then he mentions another one in verse 13, which is the sin of homosexuality. So accepted in our society today that there is such a loud voice in homosexual circles today that our government has bent to it. Yeah. Our corporations have bent to it. Our systems of education have bent to it. Our churches have bent to it. Our society has bowed down to it. And God says in verse 13, If a man lie with a man as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Hey, there's no debate about homosexuality. And these ne'er-do-well preachers that are saying they have homosexual churches and these guys that accept homosexuality into their churches and some of the leading pastors of our society, there is a pastor in Atlanta that many of our young adults, they love to listen to him. He has homosexual greeters in his church. He has men who are married to men and they're holding places of leadership in the church. God help us Amen. when we bow down to such hypocrisy and abominations before God and to call wrong right, and to call sin purity. It is an abomination against God. And Moses makes no beans about it. He said there's a sin of homosexuality. There's a sin of polygamy, verse 14. You're not supposed to be married to more than one person at a time. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness, and they shall be burned with fire. There shall be no wickedness among you that, that, to remove that. And yet today we have television shows that promote polygamy where people have several wives. We have television shows that permit and promote fornication and adultery all in the name of bachelors and bachelorettes and all this junk that you see come across the screen. It is nothing but whoredom that is paraded down Main Street and is accepted by people and Christians who sit at their house and they watch it and they applaud it and they think it's funny and they think it's good. God says you're a partaker in that evil and you will be judged by the hand of God. Amen. Oh, preacher, I, you done got way out there, preacher. 
Like one fellow told my wife, I said, boy, the preacher's on everybody tonight. <laughs> Listen, the word of God will stand. Yeah. And having done all to stand against the evils. And then another hideous sin that he mentioned in verses 15 and 16 is those who would interchange and sexual uh, with the beasts of the field. If a man lie with a beast, verse 15, he shall surely be put to death. If a woman approach unto a beast and lie down therein, thou shalt kill the woman. And the beast, bestiality, accepted in our society today. Penalty for sexual sins in verses 17 through 21. He goes on and he lists all of them. And we won't reiterate them, nor will we go over all of them tonight. We have already seen them in the previous chapter. Because he deals with them in detail all the way down through verse 21. And then after these nine, really ten, because verse 27 is included in those other nine, then he deals with an unction to holiness and God's call to holiness in verses 22 through 26. He says to us in verse 22, You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. Now there's an interesting truth in Hebrew grammar in verse 22. You shall keep all my statutes and you shall keep all my judgments. Now that word keep is an interesting word. It means that you have knowledge of them and you keep them in your mind. You see, there's not a person probably that lives that does not know the statute and the judgment that says thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. All those Ten Commandments. They know. They keep those things. They know them. But God said, that's not all. You don't just keep my statutes. You don't just keep my judgments. Notice very carefully in verse 22. He said, you do them. You put them into action. They become a part of your lifestyle and your living. And you aren't influenced by those around you. Verse 23, you shall not walk in the manner of the nation because everybody's doing it. And you go to some gathering and everybody's passing around a drink, some alcoholic beverage. You don't drink it because they're drinking it. You say, oh no, I'm a Christian. I don't participate in that. I don't drink that. Somebody says, well, if you got a glass of Sprite, or if you got a glass of tea, they're not going to know the difference between that and, and whiskey or whatever it is. Well, they may not know the difference, but you know the difference. Amen. Amen. And what's more important is God knows the difference. God knows the difference, and he knows what our testimony is. You shall not walk in the manner of the nation. Verse 24, but I have said unto you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess a land that flows with milk and honey. He said, I am the Lord your God. Now watch this carefully. Look at that very carefully. Underline it in verse 24. I am the Lord your God, which has done what? Has made you like everybody else? Has made you all the same? You all act the same way? All do the same thing? No. He said, which have separated you from other people. You're to be different. I'm to be different. Doesn't matter if they call you strange or silly or old fogey or whatever they want to call you. Doesn't matter. I have separated you from other people. Boy, you ought to highlight that. You ought to underline that. You ought to put it up here and then you ought to do it to remember it where it says, I have separated you from other people. You're to be different. You don't have to go where they go, do what they do, participate in what they participate in the sense that you become like them and do what they do. But you're separate. Does that mean that you can be in the world? Absolutely. You know what Jesus said? You're in the world but not of the world. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. I even cut up and laugh about it sometimes when you walk in a place and they got liquor on all sides of you and beer right there and wine stacked up to the hilt. You know what, I can walk right by that. I can pick it up and look at it. And you know what, it doesn't bother me a bit. You know why? Because the truth is that it has no part of my life. 
that it caused me to crave it. Now, Brother Richard, if I walk by where they're cooking a ribeye steak, <laughs> or I walk down the aisle there in that, in that beautiful pastry counter, they got a big fluffy coconut cake, or they got some cream puffs, <laughs> or they got some cinnamon buns, <laughs> or they got some peanut brittle, or some crackling cornbread. But God says, I have separated you from other people. Verse 25, you shall therefore put difference between things which are clean and things which are unclean. You know that. You don't have to have somebody go around with a magic marker and say, uh-uh, this is dirty and this is clean. You don't have to, you know what it is. You know exactly what it is. You can't sit in church and look holy and say, well, I knew that drink when I smelled it wasn't Coca-Cola. You know what's dirty and you know what's not. You know what's clean, you know what's not. God said you're to separate between those things. And verse 26, And you shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy. And notice this, And have severed you from other people. And I did it for a purpose. Look at it carefully. End of verse 26. That you should be mine. You belong to me. You belong to me. I know all of you that were raised by godly parents or Christian parents, probably many times you heard when you start outdoors, remember who you are. I remember mine many times said, now remember you belong to me. A lot of times they'd say, look, you belong to me and I better not have to come after you. You belong to me. God said, not only have I separated you in verse 24, but in verse 26 he uses a stronger word. I have severed you. I've cut you in two from that. You don't get your life from them. You don't get your thrills from them. I have severed that umbilical cord of the world from your life because I am a holy God and you should be mine. You belong to me. It all boils down to that inevitable truth. The holiness of God demands a penalty because God is a holy God. It is always that way. It will always be that way. We have to remember we don't live apart from God. We live with God. God in us. The hope of glory. Amen? Amen? Even an atheist who denies the existence of God must give an account to him. And you know there is a philosophical meandering of sociological truth. That's a long statement to say. Simply this. For you to say something does not exist means that you believe that it does exist for you to be able to deny that it exists. I had that, uh, there's a guy that came up, to, we were on a mission trip one time, and, and this guy at a service station, well, it was at a pilot station in Tallahassee, Florida. And we were pumping gas and getting things ready, and this old guy walks up to my son and said, y'all from a church group? I said, yeah. He said, I don't believe there is a God. Explain to me how there's a God. There's no such thing as a God. Well, Steve, in all of his theological wisdom, said to the man, you see that fat man over there? That's my daddy. You need to go talk to him. And the man came with me and he said, that man told me to talk to you. I said, what do you need to talk to me about? He said, y'all, some church group, there's no such thing as a God. I don't believe in God. I looked at him and I said, sir, you just told me that you do believe in God. Oh, no, I didn't. I don't believe in God. I said, yeah, you just told me you believe in God. Man, you're crazy. I didn't say that. I said, well, now listen to this. Here's the truth. For you not to believe in something, you've got to believe that it exists for you not to believe that it is. Amen. He stood there for a minute. He scratched his ear and he rubbed his nose. He said, well, you all have a good day. God is God. 
and we're to live with God in our lives. To live for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please Him in all that you do. Yielding your allegiance. Not my will, but thy will be done. And you do it glad-hearted and free. And that becomes a pathway of blessing for you. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. For thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master. I've been separated. I've been severed. That's what the songwriter was saying. My heart shall be thy throne. Henceforth I give my life to live. O Christ, for thee alone. Separated, severed, sanctified, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, thank you for your word. We know that sometimes it stings and sometimes it hurts and sometimes it cuts. But you tell us it does that in order to bring about spiritual surgery within our life. In order to heal us. In order to draw us closer to you. And sometimes the cleansing process is painful. Sometimes it's like an open wound that has alcohol poured in it. And oh God, tonight, maybe that's what we need. That that power of God can set us free from the relentless pursuit after the world. And having godliness, as Paul would say to young Timothy, therewith we can be content. Are you content in Christ tonight? Not, I pray that you will. Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's all stand. We begin singing this beautiful old hymn. We invite you to come. The altar's open. You kneel, sit, stand. But don't continue the same. Be moved by his divine power. Give it for Jesus a life that Strive he to please him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for 
Precious Lord, may we be sensitive to the truth of your word. May we receive the word of God as that engrafted, that word that is planted and grows and extends our life to bear fruit. Lord, may we leave here tonight knowing that all is well with our soul in Jesus Christ. Speak to us, Lord, now. Speak to us as we go. Speak to us as we are a part of the world tomorrow. That we may be separated. We may be severed. We may be serving. We may be sanctified in your goodness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go and tell it wherever you go. Let's all stand, join hands. We sing together our benediction. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born.